Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I am honored to have Holly Smith Abbott join us on this episode. Holly is the founder of International Credential and in Sports Advising, and Holly used to work for the NCAA. She worked in the eligibility department, and she would translate international transcripts to make sure that these student athletes were eligible to play an NCAA sport. Uh, we go over a lot today. We go about her career running at Wofford, uh, her work in compliance at the University of Richmond, her time at the NCAA, and she breaks down some basics about such things as when to sign up for the eligibility center, what's an IEP, can you take college credits at a prep school and still be NCAA eligible, what is the hardest country that it is to translate a transcript, and much, much more. Um, Holly and I have been working together for years uh, with some of my clients. She does an excellent job, and she shares a lot of great information in this episode. So thanks so much for tuning in. Here's the podcast. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm not, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Holly, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Yes. So let's start off with your college career and you ran track and field and cross country at Wofford. When did you realize you loved running enough to want to do it uh, as full time in college? Fourth grade, my parents put me in a summer track program um, in our hometown, and I had never run summer track before, and I thought it was amazing, and it was a way to just burn off some energy. I have a lot of energy. Um, so I really enjoyed it. It was something I was uh, pretty good at and uh, went through high school, and we're doing college visits. I wasn't planning on running in college, uh, but fell in love, went to Wofford, fell in love with the campus. Uh, it was about 1,100 kids at the time um, that I was there from 2000 to 2004, so I'm really dating myself. Um, but uh, the small school in Division One, great facilities, great people, and I loved, I loved everything about it. So I definitely enjoyed my time there. If Wofford College had a graduate school, I would have stayed there mm -hmm. um, to, to do my master's. Um, just because of how great it is. And I, I was the only student in my classroom in the state of Indiana at the time. So um, that was pretty crazy uh, to just to have meet so many people from all around uh, the South. And um, a lot of people are like, where, where do you live? Like, where is Indiana? So I was always like, I live like two hours from Chicago. So mm -hmm. they, they knew where that was, but yeah, it was a great time. I loved it. Where'd you grow up in Indiana? Uh, so I grew up in Mishawaka, which is the suburb of oh, South yeah. Bend. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, grew up about 10 minutes from the University of Notre Dame, big Notre Dame fan. Um, my uh, aunt works for uh, Mike Bray and she's been in the basketball office and she's actually been at Notre Dame for over 40 years. So wow. um, she started working with Digger Phelps and then Matt Doherty and now Mike Bray. So I've known Mike Bray since I was 18 years old. Um, and just grew up loving Notre Dame, but definitely didn't want to stay in my parents' backyard. Um, so I love my parents, but I needed to go away and kind of explore, uh, other parts of the country for sure. And why was Walford on your list? How they, how they come in the woodwork? Um, so my mom, uh, had a client who did college consulting on the side. He was a professor at Notre Dame and uh, based off of just talking to me, he's like, Hey, you should probably like look at this school. And we used to vacation in Myrtle beach every year. And so we stopped by on the way home. And I had looked at like Emory and Henry in Virginia and center college, like really top notch D three academic schools, um, Wittenberg in Ohio. And I literally drove on Wofford's campus and fell absolutely in love. And I'm like, this is it. I'm going here. I absolutely nothing about the school. My parents were like, well, it's 12 hours away. Maybe you should, you know, think about that. Right. I'm like, nope, I'm going here. And it just was like a feeling like I had. And um, like, it did not disappoint for sure. That's so good. You said that like in my prep school world and with college recruiting too, I always tell kids, if you can take visits, take them because you'll be able to tell, like you just said, once you step on a campus, you'll feel that energy and know if it feels comfortable and like a place you could see yourself at or yeah, it just doesn't feel right so I'm, I'm glad you said that Holly because that's very important when choosing places it's super important I mean I did overnights at several colleges and I knew right away like 
no, this isn't for me. Mm-hmm. Um, even based off of like who I was staying with, like, Hey, we just have a different vibe, but like Wofford, I mean, and the funny part was, it was in the summertime. So nobody was on campus right? and it was just like, that was it. And, um, it was cool. The Carolina Panthers have their training camp there. And, um, like, it it was just a really great vibe. And I, you know, loved the men's basketball coach there at the time, Mike Young, who's now at Virginia tech. I absolutely love Mike Young. Like I I enjoyed seeing him all the time when he comes to play Notre Dame or actually Wofford um, played Notre Dame. And so my parents hosted the entire team at their house when I was in graduate school. So it was so great. Like I absolutely, he's a great guy, great guy. The soccer coach, Rob Polson, the old, he retired great guy too. Um, just so many great people there. Like I would recommend it to everybody. I hope my daughters, my daughters go there. (laughs) You know, funny story. My dad and I, we do business all over the country for real estate and we were stopping through Spartanburg. Is that where it's located? Yeah. And just let's just go check out the gym and see if any coaches are there. And I'll be darn the only guy in the office was Mike Young. And we talked with him for probably 45 minutes when you know how busy head coaches are. And that always left a good mark uh, in my mind whenever I saw him you know, in March Madness or anything. He's just such a genuine person. I mean, what you see is what you get. Like, I mean, so many kids have just been mentored by him. I mean, even people that I graduated with that played on the basketball team, um, like still keep in touch with him. He's just a great guy. And I'm so glad he's had so much success at Wofford and at Virginia Tech. Um, he does, if anybody deserves it, he deserves it for sure. Right, right. For sure. Now, after Wofford, you went to the University of Richmond and you worked in the in the compliance office there. Yeah. First, can you tell people what the role is of a compliance office? Because everyone that's watching this wants to go play in college. And every college has a compliance office. So we can do a little compliance 101 here and explain yes. what that is and what you did when you were at Richmond. So before the University of Richmond, I, had, um, I got my master's degree at Virginia Commonwealth University uh, in their sports um, leadership program. And I... Then went to the University of Richmond um, and worked in compliance under Daniel McCarthy, who's now at South Alabama. Great guy as well, like super knowledgeable. Um, And so at the time, the eligibility center didn't exist, the NCAA eligibility center. So or they were just getting ready. They were in the development stage. And so we were doing all of the like processing of transcripts, like evaluating international prospective student athletes, domestic student athletes, um, making sure that all of the coaches were in compliance with all of the legislation. Um, the NCAA has um, manuals for division one, two, and three, and they really do read like a law manual. Um, and they're very, very thick and <laughs> there's a lot of rules. Um, so just being the overarching kind of guide, um, for the coaches, like making sure everybody is following what they're supposed to be following, turning in all the forms that they're supposed to be turning in, um, doing a lot of education. Um, so as the rules change and are kind of modified and in, in going through an, a, a different type of evolution, making sure that the coaches understand, okay, this is how it was last year, but then this is now changed and this is what we're going to have to kind of pivot towards. Um, and this is what you're going to have to do now. Uh, also at the time, um, they, uh, if students wanted to transfer to another institution, they had to have the coach's permission, um, to transfer. And so that was pretty interesting. Um, and the, uh, sometimes the coaches would let them transfer to another institution in the conference um, or maybe a rival school that's not necessarily in their conference. So kind of working through all of that, um, was definitely eye opening. Um, that was my first real job, like in college athletics, like obviously I'd gone to graduate school and, and, um, you know, learned about everything, but actually putting, you know, actually being on the ground and doing it day by day um, was a completely different thing. And I think that a lot of the compliance staff do don't get the credit they deserve because it's it's so complicated. It's so hard. Um, it's a, it can be a thankless job. But um, like I admire everybody who's in compliance because it's just such you have to have such a wealth of knowledge in so many different areas. And that's why you'll see some of the bigger institutions have um, compl- have numerous compliance staff because you need to. Um, and one may have football oversight, one may have basketball oversight, one may just do initial eligibility and that's all they do. One may do continuing eligibility. Um, one may work with the registrar and in mission. So it's, it definitely, there's a lot of cogs in the wheel to make it work. 
Yeah, and let's go back to real quick. So say uh, a coach, that, and you're working in compliance, and a coach says, hey, I like Johnny in California. Before he's going to recruit Johnny, is he going to send you the transcript and someone in co compliance is going to see, one, if they're going to be NCA eligible, and two, if they're going to have the grades to get into a specific school that's actually looking at it? That's what they should do. Okay. <laughs> so the – I. In a dream world, if I were in compliance, I would have like a very open relationship with my coaches. And if they were recruiting somebody, I would want them to, you know, gather all the information. Where have they been since year nine? Right. Have they been to multiple high schools? Is there an international component to it? I need all of the transcripts sent to me so I can make sure. And they can be unofficial as well mm -hmm. um, versus official. Like they can just be emailed to me. I want to make sure does the student one have enough core courses um, that the NCA requires to be an academic qualifier. Um, are they, if they're in 11th grade, are they projecting to be an academic qualifier? What, um, academic areas are they deficient in? Um, what teams are they playing on? Like, when do you want them to enroll? Do you want them to enroll right away after year 12? Or do you want them to take a gap year and work on their sport and then come in the next year? Um, all of those things I would want to know. Um, obviously, the NCAA has their own re academic requirements um, for each high school uh, in every state and for obvious, like obviously every country. So everything is different. So, for instance, one high school in California may offer a different course selection than another high school in California um, versus if you're dealing with an international country. The, um, the country of the United Kingdom has a set curriculum from the Ministry of Education. So everybody's taking or offered the same exact courses. So that's kind of the difference. But um, that, I mean, that's what I would do. I, this, the, I tell the kids too, like my clients as well, like you have to understand that even if you're NCAA academically eligible, if your grades aren't high enough to get into a certain institution, they could deny you admission. So if you're shooting for the Ivy League schools, um, or like a Notre Dame or, or, you know, a North Carolina or Northwestern, um, you have to have the grades. Um, because if you don't, you, you run the risk of not being admitted. All right. Let me ask you a current question here. Since a lot of schools have stopped accepting the ACT and SAT and they're looking at GPA in compliance office, you realize a GPA from like a top private academic Catholic school is going to be different than maybe a public school in a rural area. What are your thoughts on that? I, my NCAA thoughts are if the student is academically eligible, they're academically eligible from wherever they go. Fine. I get uh, that. I get that. What's, correct, what's however, Holly's opinion on this? <laughs> this is my opinion. However, um, I think that if I were in admissions, I would personally look, uh, weight those students that are doing or uh, the extra coursework. So the APs, the IBs, the honors, all of that stuff more heavily than somebody that was just, that has a 4.0 doing regular coursework um, or standard academic coursework. Uh, and also, you know, where do they go to school at? I mean, that, I think that does play in, in my personal opinion um, to are they admissible or not? Um, you know, what about the grading scale? Because there are some grading scales that are more stringent than others. Um, so what one high school, let's say one high school has 90 to 100 as an A, another high school may have 93 to 100% as an A. So do you look at that differently versus, okay, well, an A is an A. And if you, just because you go to this high school with a stronger grading scale, it doesn't matter. Right. So I think those are kind of the things that you have to work, work or look at in admissions. I, I read a book on admissions. It was uh, behind the scenes with Wesleyan. Mm -hmm. for a year, and it was fascinating. It, it just, I think admissions, whether it's prep school or college, would be such a difficult job to have. Oh, for sure. And like extracurricular activities and what types of clubs you're in. And did you just play one sport and not do anything else? I mean, like there's so many things that students have to be involved in now. I mean, for admissions purposes, I'm so glad I went to college <laughs> 20 years ago um, because I, I mean, I don't know how kids do it these days, just juggling academics, sports, clubs, um, volunteer activities, everything. It's just so much on their plate and you know they can experience burnout and and it's it's just a tough thing and you had covid and all that kind of stuff and people were at home and homeschooling and 
it's been a it's been a whirlwind of a, the past couple of years for sure. Oh, I know. It's it's been it's been tough for the kids, and you know, I wonder how much of it is self driven or how much of it's driven from the parents, right? Trying to relive through their kids, and you you see it, I see it, and you know, my percent. This is something new. I'm starting to uh, promote now, but 96 percent of my players go to college, mm-hmm. and some people might think, well, why isn't 100 percent? Because those two kids every year that go to prep school, they realize, you know what, before I pick a school based on basketball, I don't really love it. Maybe I'm going to pick the college for four years. I'm actually having a good experience at. And I still, Holly, see that as a benefit of prep school because it let you know, hey, this might be more work than you're wanting to put in on the court. Maybe it's not for you if you don't love it that much. So For sure. For yeah. sure. I mean, it's not. And that's what I tell, and that's what I tell the kids. I'm like, listen, I'm like, do you the, so you have 20 practice hours that are countable right but they're not counting training table you're not counting academic study table you're not counting meetings you're not counting you know getting your legs taped up or doing massage or, or, or anything like that I mean that adds like 10 hours onto your you know 20 hour of practice you're not counting all the travel you have to go to I mean some of my coaching friends are, you know, coaching in Texas and they're in the whack and like for their sport and they're traveling to San Diego and UNLV and all of these places. And it's just, you know, it's a lot in like, they're not flying private. Like, cause if you're in like an Olympic sport, you're probably not flying private. Um, so you have to rely on the airlines. Is it going to, are you going to be delayed? Are you going to be canceled? Did you take a bus? Like, it's just a lot. So if you don't love it, like if you don't, just breathe it every day. I mean, your college experience not playing, it's okay. And you'll enjoy it just as much, you know, play intramural. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Well, to some parents, yeah, there is something wrong with that. But yeah, you're exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Now, you were worked in cl- compliance at Richmond. And then what made you uh, make the jump to the NCAA? So when I was in graduate school, I said, my end goal is to be at the NCAA. I don't know why I said that. I just wanted to be there. Um, I'm from Indiana. So obviously it made sense that I'd want to go back home. Um, my husband was in medical school at the time at Indiana university. And so I literally just moved, um, back to Indiana and was the eligibility center was starting. And so I was applying for jobs there. Um, and my supervisor or Daniel at the university of Richmond knew, um, a colleague at the eligibility center and sent in my resume and the fact that I was, we had um, done international academics at Richmond for incoming um, students, or we had looked at credentials, really helped me uh, get into the spot that I ended up getting into, which was an international academic certification. And so at the age of 25, I was at the NCAA and I'm looking around, I'm like, well, <laughs> well, I'm here. So let's, let's hope this goes well. Um, but it really, it really did go well. Uh, I loved it. Uh, we really built myself and, and uh, a few others really built the international academic uh, certification review staff from the bottom up. Um, we had a couple of people, uh, that transitioned over from Iowa, um, and where the, where the clearinghouse used to be. So the clearinghouse used to be in Iowa, but now it it shifted over to, to be in a separate area from the NCAA initially. And then it actually moved into the, the build NCAA's building. Um, but we really, uh, just, I mean, I was learning, I'm learning every day. I'm still learning every day. Like international credential evaluating is, um, very difficult. It's a niche, but it's very difficult because you have to know the educational systems of every country and obviously they change. And so you kind of have to be up on what's going on in every country. Like for instance, you know, I I'm dealing with a student from Ukraine while, well, his school doesn't exist anymore. So how is this going to work out? How are we going to make this happen um, for him to play at um, one of the schools that's recruiting him? So you, it's not just uh, educational issues, it's social and, uh, you know, governmental issues too, that you're working through. Um, so it, it's definitely, it's definitely been interesting. I've been doing it for 16 years now. Um, it's something that I'll always continue to do. I just love kind of credential evaluating. It's kind of dorky, <laughs> but it's not, it's like, uh, but it's, it, I'm, like I said, I'm learning something new every day. It's, it pushes you to research 
um, into like various schools. Like for instance, I, I, right now I'm looking at a, a student from Brazil that was in, uh, in I international baccalaureate school on a normal, like August to June calendar. And then he went to a traditional Brazilian school, which is now on a February to December calendar with like different courses. And then he's now he's at a school in the U S so it's, there's three different educational systems working here. And I have to, it's kind of like you're, you're putting together a puzzle, right? So you're figuring out, okay, what has this kid already done? What does he need to do? What are his grades? You know, I'm dealing with three different grading scales. What is his GPA? So all of these things um, kind of fit together in a puzzle and every puzzle is different. I've not had one student with the same GPA, with the same, with the same core courses in like the 16 years I've done it. So basically, with all that being said, you're a translator. Yes, yes. I'm not, but I'm not a, I'm not an official translating company. So when I have people ask me, can I translate line by line? I cannot do that. <laughs> so, well, I understand that, but I'm saying you're translating foreign transcripts, tricky situations to make sure they can fit within NCA and college eligibility. Yes, for, yes, for that specific country too. I mean, I'll have kids that'll bop around, like they'll start in Senegal, then they'll go to France, then mm. they'll come to the US and then they'll go to three, three different schools in the US. And then you'll find them and then <laughs> they will, and then you'll put them in a prep school and it's so it's like, and then I'll be like, figure this out. So it's, uh, that's kind of what I do. Um, and I mean, I have fun doing it. Is it frustrating at times for sure. Uh, but it's it's fun uh, because you like to see what happens with a student, like when they go on to a school and they have like the best four years and they graduate and, you know, make a difference. Yeah, we're going to get into your consulting uh, here in a minute, but I want to go back to the NCA real quick. Yeah. It catches a lot of heat. What, what was the vibe like working there? I was kind of isolated into like, because like I said, we're like niche. So yeah. I only caught the heat. We only really caught the heat in my department when there was a, a very high profile student athlete that ended up being a non-qualifier academically from a high profile school. And we would usually get a call um, as to, you know, why isn't the student um, why is the student not qualifier? What's wrong? Like, and then they would pursue uh, an initial eligibility waiver, uh, which is what schools can do if the student ends up being an academic non-qualifier. Like there are options out there that they could pursue. Um, but I mean, they do overall, they do, it does seem like they do catch a lot of heat. Um, I think with what the environment is now, um, it's definitely changing. Uh, I really hope with the changes that the academics are still constant like there's still academic requirements like across the board that schools have to abide by uh because at the end of the day you're not setting a student up for success if they're not academically ready in college yeah it's not yeah and what were some common mistakes you would see at the ncaa that just people could have fixed on their end or let me, uh, let me rephrase that holly what what is something you saw that you need to let the listeners of this show know to take care of so it doesn't become an issue potentially with eligibility did you see common mistakes? Yes. So when a student would transition from, um, let's say they were coming from France and they were going to a school in the United States, the school in the United States would always make them repeat the year that they finished in, in their home country. So you'll have duplicative coursework. That's a big problem. Duplicative coursework, the NCAA only counts one of those courses. So if you take English 10 in France and you take English 10 at the U.S. school, they're only counting one. So typically when you repeat a year, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but you just have to be careful about not taking duplicative coursework um, or repeating too many years. Like you have a student that does year nine and 10 in Nigeria and then comes to the U.S. and does year nine and 10 again. I mean, that yeah. like that's that's a big issue in terms of how many core courses that a student would actually have towards their grand total of 16 for division one or division two. For us, that was the biggest, the biggest issue that we, that we had or not taking the right courses, like taking courses that are denied because they're not, not academic. Uh, they're not, you know, academic in nature. Um, business courses, somebody let me saying that, you know, this business course counts. Well, no, it's, it really doesn't count because it's not four year university preparatory, right? stuff like that. I just want to give, I'm just going to do a quick commercial for you right here because I've worked with you, Holly, on multiple kids and, you know, your insurance plan, 
You are who people <laughs> hire to make sure when the day comes to sign with the college, everything's good to go. So Holly, you know, say a kid's come over to prep school, which is the vein we've worked in, and they are coming from a foreign country. For some kids, they have to work with, with Holly if I'm going to take them on as a client because Holly will go through their past transcripts and then she'll figure out what school they're going to. And she will give a prescription to the new school and say, hey, this student athlete's already done these courses. Based on your school curriculum, he needs to take these courses to be eligible by the NCAA and you know, graduate from your school. So you need to find people out there that's going to keep you from running into headaches. And if you are coming from overseas or if you've transferred a lot of high schools in the U.S., Holly is the person for you. So that's just a quick infomercial. <laughs> and uh, at the end of this, she'll give your contact information. But, you know, you want to avoid all potential hiccups, right? And prep schools can fix a lot of stuff and they'll make sure a lot of this is right. But not every admission department, you know, can think big picture on this. So Holly is an insurance plan. Thank just want to put that out there. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So let's do a couple things here. Just basics. So I want to, I want to educate the people that are not familiar with this stuff. What is the NCA Clearinghouse and what does that do? Corey, the NCA Eligibility Center. <laughs> is that now the new name of the Clearinghouse? Yes. Okay, yes. cool. No, All right. Yeah, no Clearinghouse anymore. Okay. The NCA Eligibility Center is a department within the NCAA that um, makes sure a student is one, an amateur, and two, academically prepared to go to university. They also have other departments such as high school review, which is typically deals with domestic high schools or Canadian high schools um, outside of Quebec in most instances. And they also have a academic review team and the academic review team reviews uh, initial eligibility waivers. So if a student is an academic non-qualifier, meaning that they didn't meet certain criteria, academically based off of just their high school record, um, they the, the university might file a waiver on their behalf because there may be mitigation such as COVID or, you know, somebody passing away or um, a war in their country, et cetera. Um, so all of those departments, they also have, I'm sorry, they also have a customer service staff. So they have a staff out in Denver and then they, um, they also have a staff in-house that answers uh, public calls and also answers um, the membership institution calls uh, and walks through, maybe they'll walk through a case. So if, you know, a student athlete is missing something and the member institution calls in and says, hey, student XYZ, what transcripts are they missing? Or why is the review like this? Then they'll be able to explain it to them. You know, hey, student XYZ is missing a transcript from this high school and we need, you need to contact the high school to get the transcript in so the student's file will be complete and then it can go on to academic review. So there's several departments that kind of work together within the entire eligibility center. Gotcha. That seems like it's going to take a lot of bandwidth and a lot of manpower to do all those requirements. It, it, there are, yes, it is a lot. Um, there, there are people that are just do amateurism reviews. There are people that do academic reviews. There are people that are cr cross-trained that do both academic and amateurism reviews. High school review is a separate department. The academic review team is a separate department. So there, there's a lot of, there are a lot of staff there. Um, they're all um, very well educated. They're all, you know, have experience. Um, they, you know, I, I am still good friends with several folks in the eligibility center um, and they're great. And uh, you know, this is a busy time for them because they're getting ready. All these kids are getting ready to go to school and they're already at school. And some of these kids at school are missing stuff still. Um, and so it's kind of like the race to the end mm -hmm. uh, to get them all ready and get them on the field. Um, especially right now. I mean, cause you already have teams playing games like soccer, football this weekend, right. I mean, football last weekend, um, all sorts of stuff going on. So cross country uh, is going on. So there's a lot of things going on to get the, get the, uh, the student athletes out on the field, the various fields. So they do a lot of work. Like I said, the summer was the busiest time for me. I would work 10 hours a day there and take work home with me because it was just so many kids, just the crush of kids. Um, and, you know, we got it done, but I, I don't envy them this summer for sure. <laughs> so it's been pretty busy from what I understand. Oh, I bet. Now you also do appeals. You help with that, help programs and players with appeals to the NCAA? Yes. So I do help, um, I do help student athletes, uh, obviously they're, they're 
um, at a member institution or a member institution it is filing a waiver on their behalf. So I will help the institution with the waiver um, and prep everything before it goes in for review. And I may have um, I may have worked with a student as well prior to that waiver. Like there are some students that you know a member institution will send me that there is there is nothing that I can do because it's too late. Like this, the students in the last semester are almost ready to graduate. And we, I, I can tell them, hey, this student is going to be deficient in these in these areas. Let's get that waiver ready. Let's, you know, let me talk to the student. Okay, what's been going on? Like, tell me, you know, give me your life story from ninth grade on. Um, and so kind of weaving a story together um, based off and using that to look at their academics. Like maybe there was a semester the student did poorly in school. Well, their grandmother may have passed away that semester that they live with. And that is a big factor in how are they actually doing in school that obviously affects their schooling. So that so if you're at the certification level, like where I worked at, I wouldn't know that their grandmother passed away. I would just look at their transcript and be like, oh, they did terrible this semester. Um, that's something that the academic review team looks at. You know, is there a correlation to doing poorly um, during the semester, like w what happened. And so that's where you can kind of explain that in the waiver process. Yeah. But it seems like before COVID there were appeals being made for star athletes to transfer. And it's like, want to be closer home to mom or this and that. And it just seemed like it was a way for college programs to kind of game the system to get a player eligible immediately. And I'm not saying you took part in that, but like that's Whoa. what the perception was. Right. So yeah. yes. And so that is, a different type of waiver that is outside of the eligibility center. Okay. Um, that is like before they had the transfer portal and before, before they allowed everybody to transfer. So obviously there were sports that, you know, if you transferred, you had to sit out for a year. And so the school, school B right. would file an appeal saying, Oh, well, you know, Johnny from school A wants to be closer uh, to XYZ grandparent or parent because of this issue. And so that's, that's kind of the waiver, but yet they would be like 500 miles away from, <laughs> from their, whatever family member they wanted to be close to in some cases. So, um, that I think with the transfer portal, that's definitely decreased some of that, um, because kids just nowadays have just leave. <laughs> so, uh, which can cause a lot of havoc, um, with, you know, coaches and, and the team dynamics and all that kind of stuff. So it's been a very interesting, very interesting year with all of that. Okay, Holly, a lot of prep schools for a post-grad year say that kids can retake either one class or if you have an IEP, you can retake three classes. Can you explain what classes specifically these kids can retake and why they might want to do that? Sure. Is this for, this is for NCA purposes? Or yes. Just for, okay. So for NCA purposes, the student has to graduate on time to be able to take that plus one class that preps that fifth year of high school. So let's say a student is a student's going from a U.S. to a U.S. high school. Yep. So they graduate from their first high school in four years. They then go on and do a fifth year at prep school for a PG year. So they could take the NCA would count up to one additional core course post-grad. This is the strict rule. This is, it, this is not COVID, the, the COVID rules that are currently out right now. So the student could take one. If the student has a documented IEP that's been approved through the Office of Disability Services with the NCAA and graduated on time, they would be able to do a plus three. So whether that's a retake or whether that's another core course. So they don't necessarily have to be retakes. They could be a plus one in an, in an academic area that the student wants to take that would then add on to their GPA. So for instance, let's say they got a D in English 12 and they went to prep school and they're really interested in an English course about Shakespeare and they have not already taken that course. That's okay. So let's say they take that course, get an A in it. Well, then that A knocks out that D. Can you well. go back to retake a class from freshman year if it's core or is it only within the junior and senior year? Well, so for domestic students and international students that have gone on to domestic education, the NCA has a rule for division one that you must achieve 10 core courses prior to the seventh semester of high school. And those 10 courses are locked in. So that GPA and those courses are locked in. So 
for me, when I would be advising, I would, let's say I would, I would personally advise a student to take something that could add on to their GPA. So is it wouldn't necessarily knock out the grade nine English because for that, from that perspective, to meet that first requirement, you have to, that's going to be locked in. Now, gotcha. if you're an international student, let's say you're an international student and you graduated in your home country or another international country, and you came over to do a prep year at whatever prep school, you would not be subjected to that requirement. So they would evaluate you strictly off of international credentials. So a student that presents all international credentials is not held to the requirement of presenting 10 core courses prior to the seventh semester. Because some schools in some countries, their high school is only seven sem or is only six semesters. Mm -hmm. Like they graduate after year 11. So they wouldn't necessarily be, they can't necessarily be held to that. Right. Now you mentioned IEP. Can you explain to people what an IEP is and how kids would go about getting one? So it's an individualized educational plan. So um, it's what the NCA uh, has is the Office of Disability Services or impacting disability. So if a student has a social disability and um, a psychological disability, they're autistic, they have ADHD, and it's documented, they can go ahead once they're registered with the eligibility center and they have their NCA ID number and account, they can go ahead and submit paperwork to the Office of Disability Services and be reviewed. Um, that is to like, that's completely a separate person um, that the that the NCA works with. Um, so it's not somebody like in-house that reviews all this stuff. Um, and so once they approve um, the, you know, they approve their disability, they say, yes, you have met the threshold of, of sending in all the documentation. And yes, there's an issue there. Their account would then be documented. Um, and they would also on the internally, internally documented, and they would also receive confirmation that they have been approved or denied. Um, and so it would be up to the student to share that with wherever they're being recruited, obviously, yep. because you have all of these types of protections and stuff like that. Um, I actually have a student that, that, um, was approved through the process, um, and has a documented IEP and that was not something that I could share with the school that he attended, that it was up to him to share that with the school he attended, um, because of, you know, HIPAA and all that kind of stuff that you, you know, you can't really get into that. So, but it was great because he had access to a bunch of things at the, at the school, right. the school worked with him. Um, he had extra time on tests. He had tutors. They had, um, the, the school is, is pretty well known for, for having, um, a, a large, uh, office of disability services on their campus and having a lot of resources for those students, regardless of athletic talent. Yeah. And there are prep schools out there too, Holly, that specialize in this. So exactly. Anyone listening that has a, a child with IEP, uh, there, yeah, there are some that really thrive with, with helping those kids out. Um, let's talk about IB. What's yes. IB stand for? Baccalaureate. Yes. International Baccalaureate. It stands for International Baccalaureate. These kids are wonderful. Um, International Baccalaureate is a very, very hard, uh, rigorous curriculum uh, that is offered in the United States at certain schools and offered, it's offered worldwide. So a student could earn, let's say, um, one of my, the schools I work with um, in Quebec, uh, they offer the IB curriculum. So what the student would do is they would graduate, you know, they would get their normal graduation credential, and then they would go on for further study to earn their International Baccalaureate diploma. Um, they have to take several exams and score a certain score uh, to get that IB diploma. And um, I've had several kids with the IB diploma come to the United States to universities and get incoming university credit. Um, yes. So that has definitely helped them out. So technically, some students with IB have been sophomore academic standing, but with freshman eligibility in terms of playing seasons. So that's been really beneficial for them because they've been, then they've been able to go on and get their master's degree and still have, and still be able to play. Right. But uh, now this is a rumor. You tell me if it's wrong or not, that most colleges in America just don't put as much credence into an IB degree as maybe universities in Europe do. I think it just, I, you're, 
I can't speak for every university. Oh, but, I'm just saying it stereotypically. Yeah. But yeah stere yes. Yes. Um, now, if a student presents an, an advanced level or an A level exam from the United Kingdom, I mean, they 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 take a lot of credence into those because those are super hard to 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 uh, to pass and do really well in. Um, yes, I mean, I, I like any incoming credit, like three hours, like six hours, is going to help the student out because you know you have to be full time when you're in your sport. But let's say you're you're running cross country and you're taking 15 hours or 12 hours of, of, of college credit and you're struggling and you know you have to drop below full-time status i mean having those extra hours is going to help you i get that but i've had people from around the world say we're going to stay in our country have john and get the ib and then come over for a post-grad year because the ib is so great and i you know, there's a debate on that. Yeah, go ahead, do the one year of post grad after you get your IB, or you come over earlier, still get good education. You won't get the IB, but you'll have multiple years within the prep school system, right. which is kind of ideally what it takes. So I just wanted to ask you, like, you know, what what is your thoughts on that? So, I mean, ideally, and ideally for a student athlete in a prep school, they should be there two years. I mean, ideally, but not you know, ideally. yeah, yeah, ideally. Um, just to get the, just to get the lay of land, but off, oftentimes they can only be there one year. So if it were me, I, I would come over earlier to get that experience, not necessarily get the IB diploma. Yeah. Um, if they're able to get it, but I'm with you. I'm with you on that one. I just, I just, it's, it's good talking to you about your thoughts on that. Let me ask you this, the NCAA eligibility center, when does it, student athlete when should they register for that and why do you need to register so you need to register um for one so they could process your your paperwork your academic credentials and and you also have to you know fill out a questionnaire for your amateurism like list the teams that you've played on and your coaches and the contact information and did you you know receive actual necessary expenses and that, that's that i'm glad i'm not in that department i'm in the academic side that is Ooh, that is hard stuff. Um, but you have to be able to register. You have to register in order to take an official visit, number one. So okay. an official visit is a paid visit from the member institution. They're paying for you to come and visit for a certain amount of time and, and you know, spend the night on campus and do all the campus things. Um, personally, I would definitely register no later than the end of your, you know, the no later than the end of your junior year. I mean, that's my personal opinion. I've had kids register a lot later because it's not on their radar, right? Like they get, they're being recruited at like a later age or they just didn't think that they had to do it. Um, but for me, it would be no later than after your junior year. It, I would probably do it the end of my sophomore year, then a 10th grade and not necessarily turn a transcript in at that moment, but just going through the registration process, getting your ID number that you can share with coaches. You can say, that's a good recruiting tool. Hey, coach, here, I'm already registered at the eligibility center. Here's my NCID number, you know, add me to your institution request list or what is known as an IRL, right? Um, so you're actively recruiting me. Like that's, I mean, that's what I would do. Or if you're a very strong student academically, send in your six semester transcript, and try to meet the early academic qualifier uh, requirements, which are there's more stringent academic requirements. You're waived through after your junior year as an early academic qualifier. All you have to do on the back end is turn your final transcript in with proof of graduation. So then you're sitting after your 11th grade year as a final academic qualifier. Like you can tell the coaches, hey, I've already been through the eligibility center academically. I'm already a yes. All I have to do is graduate. I mean, obviously, do well your 12th grade year, but in graduate, but that's all I have to do. So really you should do that as a student athlete to make it easier for the college recruiting you. And that way they're not spending as much bandwidth. And if it is too much bandwidth, try to figure this out. They just might move on to somebody else who's gotten this taken care of. Ye possibly. Okay. All right. Possibly. Never heard you look, Hey, people are looking for every advantage out there. Holly, this could be just one that only makes it easier. Like if you got two kids that are the exact same kid, everything else, but this yeah. kid's already taken care of, but the eligibility center coaches look for the path of at least resistance too. So, and I could totally say that domestically now internationally, yeah. it's a little bit different. So if a student is completely international and a coach is over at some showcase and sees this student and they're in 12th grade and they have to have them and they're not registered. And that's 
you know, when the institution contacts me and says, okay, we have this student from this country, here's all their credentials, do an academic review, send it to us. And then we'll, and then it'll be, you know, if it's a no, then they're going to tell, they're just going to stop recruiting. If it's yep. a yes, they're going to get, the, they're going to work with the kid, get the kid registered, everything sent in. So I'm kind of doing a pre initial eligibility evaluation before they actually go through the whole, the whole system and waste the, and waste the time. Perfect. If, if, if the student's a no. Perfect. Let me ask you about taking college credits during a post-grade year to prep school. Some families don't want to do that. And and I I have not figured this answer out yet. I haven't looked into it. So I'm going to ask you, I've saved it for you right now, but does that start oh, a clock with the NCAA or does that hurt them at all or not? If they need to be part-time. Well, need what, part-time. what constitutes, constitutes part-time? So, uh, part-time is determined by each specific institution. So if they're going to Sawgrass Community College, for instance, and and Sawgrass says nine hours is full time. They better take six. So the NCA doesn't have a set standard on full time enrollment because it's different at every institution. So it's institution, it's not NCA. It's the post grad institution. Yeah, post full time is determined by the post grad institution that they are attending. Oh, so not the eventual have- college they're going to. No. So a lot, what a lot of, um, a lot of junior hockey players will do, like hockey players that are in juniors that have already graduated high school, they will take, um, two courses a semester because that's typically part-time of three credits each. So they're taking a total of six credit hours a semester through a lot of them go through Athabasca, which is out of Alberta, Canada, um, it's all online. And so we know, because having sent, you know, having worked with kids that have gone through that university, I know that six credits is going to keep the student part-time. Gotcha. Okay, perfect. If you're on a rooftop, you can shout to all the high school athletes across America. What do you want to make sure? What's the one thing you want to make sure or advice you want to give them that you've seen mistake happen in the past over and over again? Like what's, what's your advice to them? Take your academics seriously from grade nine. Yes. I can't tell you how many kids that I've run into that I'm like, it's too late. Like there's, you need to go junior college. Like you are not going to be a final qualifier. And just the looks on their faces, it's heartbreaking because everybody is, you know, they have people in their head saying, you're the best X, Y, Z in your sport. Don't worry about that class. And like for us, like domestically, we're looking at year nine, 10, 11, 12. And what the eligibility center is doing for international kids is also looking at nine, 10, you know, nine and up, or maybe nine, 10 and 11 and 12. So for instance, like in Ontario, the universities in Ontario, Canada only look at the students' six courses in their 12th grade. They don't necessarily look at nine, 10, and 11, but we do. So that's just a big difference. I mean, take it seriously. Like I, one of my clients um, that now plays in the NFL and we had, he had a football camp in Quebec and I, and I went up there and did the academic piece for his students and, or for the kids doing the camp. And I explained to them, like, you know, there's only 1% of the students in high school that go on to college that go on to the NFL draft. Like that's 1% of a million kids, like men's football. There's a million high school kids over a million high school kids that play football and only 1% of those go to the NFL. So that's why academics is so so important because at the end of the day, if you don't have your academics and you don't have your college degree, like, and you're done playing football, like, what are you going to do? So that's, I mean, I'm a, I'm, I am can tell I'm a super big academic person. Um, I love college sports. I think it's a great conduit to get an education, but at the end of the day, you got to go to class. You got to do your work. Yeah. Well, it's college. It's not professional. So yeah, you got to do class work. Exactly. What's the toughest country for you to work with uh, oh. as far as transcript goes? So I can typically read the transcripts in native language for most countries. Um, Anything in Arabic, it's, it's, or Cyrillic. So Egypt would be a difficult country for me because you don't see a lot of Egyptians. Yeah. Um, you know, China, you don't see a lot of Chinese kids come over and play sports um, because they're typically stay in their home country. So those are the, those are, you know, the countries that where you don't see a lot of kids come over and play um, at, at the NCAA level are harder because I don't have a chance to review their transcripts as much. Um, gotcha. Or students that have gone to multiple uh, countries that are completely different. <laughs> yeah. All right, a couple more. We're getting, we're getting close to finishing here. So but yeah. other good questions. 
you know, what are your thoughts on the future of NCAA and college basketball? I mean, we kind of see how the major power fives are thinking of football and potentially breaking off, but you do a lot in basketball. Like what's your crystal ball say? Oh, I, I could see, I honestly feel that they're watching football to see what happens. So if they break off and form their own, you know, conferences and make a conference and their own, you know, football games and stuff, will the power five and basketball do the same thing? I think they're watching to see what's going to happen. And if that happens, then, you know, is there going to be like, what is the NCAA going to do? Um, are they going to work with them? Are they not going to work with them? Are they going to make up their own academic guidelines and their own amateurism guidelines? I think that's, I mean, I think, I don't know. I think that's what they're probably watching to see what happens. I mean, in conference realignment, obviously is a big, is a big deal. You know, is Notre Dame going to join a conference? I mean, that's like the biggest thing going on in my hometown. Like, right. what are they going to do? Um, you know, their hockey teams in the big 10, the rest are in the ACC. Like that's, you know, that's kind of, you know, what the big things are in my mind. I just hope that there's some academics that still stay, you know, requirements for the kids. Right. You'd hope. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of gave a brief pitch earlier on your company, but why don't you tell the people listening and watching, like, you know, who should read, what do you, what do you, what does your consulting company do? What's its name? Where can they find you? And kind of who should reach out to you? Like what kind of client are you looking for that you can help? So my company's International Credential and in Sport Advising. Um, the website is International Credentials for Sport, the number four dot com. And basically what I do is everything academic. So if a student or a member institution or a recruiting service, because I can work with anybody, um, I'm not, I'm personally not a recruiting service, but I can work with recruiting services. Um, if they have a student athlete that they feel is potentially uh, problematic, like their academics aren't great, um, they're not sure uh, how to evaluate them academically or how the NCAA is going to do that, um, they, that would be something that I would do for them. Um, if they're bringing kids over and placing them in preparatory schools, they want to know, okay, what does the kid look like in their home country? What courses in what year of schooling should they be in the United States? That's something I do as well. Or if the student has already gone through the eligibility center and is a no, and they want to file an initial eligibility waiver, that's something that a member institution would contact me for and say, Hey, we have Johnny from Ireland. He came back as a no. Can you review his academic credentials and tell us why, number one? And two, what are the chances you know, of us getting a waiver? Like based off of academically, what does he look like? Um, can you research and delve into something deeper like that? So I, I do have private clients and private families um, from all over the world, very heavy in Quebec because I've done a lot of work in Quebec um, and their educational system is completely different than the rest of Canada. Um, but I'm also on retainer at several member institutions and I do all of their academic reviews for all of their international students, no matter where they're from and for all of their sports. Um, individual coaches that I have relationships with, it's typically men's basketball because that's typically the problematic situation. Right. So, um, so that's, you know, that's what I do. Um, I've been doing this, like I said, for 16 years. Uh, I, while at the eligibility center, I developed a lot of the policy and procedure for the various countries and how the NCA eligibility center reviews, you know, XYZ country. Um, so having worked on the inside and now working on the outside, I kind of have the perspective of, okay, I know how they're going to evaluate the student. Um, here's maybe some problematic situations or scenarios that may happen. Let's see how we can fix this before it actually goes through a review. Perfect. And I just want to pipe in too. We've worked together on multiple clients of mine and you've helped them get figured out on what classes to take at their eventual prep school. And the families, the feedback they give on you, Holly, is just, it's through the roof. They really enjoy oh. working with you. You know, they're nervous about coming to America and sending their kid, you know, many right. time zones away. And I do my part connecting them, but you help ease them in academically. You, you, you know, temper some of their concerns. So, you know, I know the families just appreciate you and love working with you because you do, you do a great job. Oh, thanks. It's, I love working with the families. I love working with the kids. Um, you know, it's up to them at the end of the day. I yeah. mean, I just give them the blueprint. So if the student athlete does the work, I said, Hey, this is going to work out for you. All you have to do is put the effort in and, um, and you can do it. And obviously I'm there for them as they go through the process, 
you know, I'll do uh, semester reviews for them. So let's say they finish up their fall semester at a U.S. prep school. They want me to send me their transcript. I'll say, okay, here's where you're standing right now. What are you taking next semester? Here are the grades we, we want to focus on. We want to focus on you getting these, you know, this an A and this, a B and this, and, you know, making sure that they're maximizing their potential. Got it. Uh, is there anything we did not go over today that you think people should know about or you think we hit it all? I hope we hit it all. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we did know, a lot of 101 hobbies, today. I, my hobbies, I, I love college hockey, Frozen Four is like one of my favorite things to go to. Um, you know, the, the obviously March Madness is also very good during, during the month of March is like one of my favorite months of the year. But um, yeah, I just... I'm like I said, I'm very blessed in what I do to be able to help people, to be able to help kids reach, you know, their goals. I've had a lot of, you know, training and background at the NCAA. I'm thankful for my time there. I'm thankful for my time at Richmond. And I've been around a lot of really good people that have been my mentors and that have been my, that are my colleagues. And so obviously being around you, obviously, even though we don't live in the same state, but it has been great to work with you. And I know we're going to do big things in the future and you're going to keep bringing over all of the international student athletes. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to keep working with you, Holly, because I think you're so good and so valuable at what you do. Um, last thing, what's your favorite movie? Ooh, well, I have a five and a two-year-old, so <laughs> In we tend to watch a lot of Pixar movies. I do love Monsters University. That's like one of my favorite movies. Um, but I also like, you know, Dallas Buyers Club and Spotlight. Like if I want to get a serious yeah. movie going on. Those two movies are uh, very interesting to me, but yeah, it's typically Pixar, like Coco and <laughs> Sing Two was a big one, and you know what your daughter likes. <laughs> yeah, the same stuff, and I'll tell you what, which I did not know until I had daughters and watching Pixar. But you will cry as an adult at every Pixar movie once you have kids. Do you, Do you I experience know. that? I, I, my wife well, and I literally start laughing because we're both doing this at the end of every Pixar movie. There's adult humor in there, and it just oh, goes yeah. right over the head. So that's that's the funny part, and like it's so interesting because if you've ever seen Toy Story, they have the pizza truck, the Pizza Planet truck, and that Pizza Planet truck they put in different movies. So I saw it in Coco, like they like hide it in different movies, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, there's the Pizza Planet truck from Toy Story. So it's uh, it's it's very interesting. Like I watched all the Toy Stories, and like I you fall in love with characters because like they can relate to you even though they're animated. Um, and I think that's, it kind of takes you away from the real, real world a little bit. Um, just, you know, to be in that moment with your kids and, and you know, step away from work. I think work-life balance is super important. Like oh, yeah. in everything you do. Um, at the end of the day, like I want to be known as mom. Um, and, you know, I pour myself into my children because they're only young once, right? yeah no i got the little rugrats downstairs you probably heard them in the background and the, and the puppies so yeah. it's uh it's it's a yeah we don't you don't work conventional hours i don't either we don't go to an office it's it's kind of how we set it up and i think we both love it but yes. um it's all about helping the kids to make the right you know give we give them all the information we can at the end of the day they have to be the ones that are working their butt off in the classroom and on the court Right, right. So, right. Exactly. It's, 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 they're the talented ones. I, like I said, like you give the blueprint, I give the blueprint and they're the ones that have to execute that. And so it's up to them. I mean, they, they're kind of charge of their own destiny, really. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Holly, thank you so much today for joining the podcast. This is Holly Smith yeah. Abbott. Uh, all her contact information will be in the show notes. Feel free to reach out to you, to her, if you have any questions on eligibility issues and um, I highly recommend her uh, for this field. She's the best. She's the best in the business. So if you guys have any other questions or concerns, feel free to reach out to me. All my information is on the website at prepathletics.com. Feel free to subscribe on YouTube or on all the major podcasting platforms. And we'll keep getting great, great guests on like Holly. So thank you so much for tuning in. Holly, thank you so much. Thank you and, for having uh, me. Yeah, we'll see you guys next time.